Hi everyone, I'm just um, recording this video to make up for the class that was cancelled last week. Uh, today we are going to be looking at Titus and Philemon, uh, two of the epistles written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, so we'll um, take a quick look at these two books and I hope that you're able to uh, watch this video uh, and catch up on what we missed um, this past week. So let me just share my screen. Okay, so uh, just to begin with, uh, we uh, see that Titus was written by Paul. Uh, we see that right in the first verse of the first chapter saying, uh, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Um, and then he um, continues to say that this is written to Titus, my true son in our common faith. So we have the recipient there as well. Uh, like we've talked about before, um, these introductions to uh, the letters are very important because uh, in that description of Paul, of who Paul is, or what the work that he's doing, is usually an um, an important indication of what he wants to communicate through the letter. Uh, so, if we look at um, Titus one one, uh, right after he says who he is, he says he's the apostle of Jesus Christ to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness in the hope of eternal life. Um, so he is looking at increasing the faith of the uh, those who belong to the church um, and their knowledge of the truth uh, with the goal that through that increase in faith and knowledge, they are going to grow in godliness um, in the hope of eternal life in Christ. Uh, so this is uh, what he's going to be talking a lot about in uh, in the letter in Titus. Uh, and we'll see how he addresses this uh, issue of uh, holiness, of faith, of um, godliness, and looking forward to Christ's return. So the letter was written sometime after First Timothy, um, and uh, it was written while Paul was uh, on his way to a place called Nicopolis, because we see him mention that place uh, a little later on in Titus uh, chapter 3, verse 12, uh, written around AD 62 to 66. Um, so uh, just a little bit about who Titus is, because we know that he's the recipient of this letter. Um, Galatians 2, 1 to 5 gives us an introduction to Titus. Uh, Paul is writing to the Galatians and he's telling them about some of the work that he did. And uh, he says, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. We see Titus mentioned here. Um, I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders. I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. Um, this matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. So uh, here Paul is uh, talking about Titus joining him and Barnabas when they went back to the council in Jerusalem to address this issue of Jews coming in and uh, calling uh, Gentile believers to um, to follow some of the laws that were in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, and uh, one of the specific things was circumcision. Uh, and uh, we also know from this passage in Galatians that Titus uh, was a Gentile believer. Uh, he was a Greek. Uh, so. Um, he says that even Titus was not compelled to be circumcised by the Jerusalem council. 
Um, a few other things we know about Titus is that he was sent through the Corinthian church. When we read in 2 Corinthians uh, about uh, this situation that arises with the church where uh, there is a misunderstanding, um, there is some conflict that arises with the Corinthian church. Um, when Paul addresses uh, some people who have come against him, who are um, not uh, not very supportive of his leadership, uh, and some issues that have arisen in the church, uh, he has to deal with it with uh, a certain degree of severity. And um, when he does that, um, there is a little bit of uh, tension that uh, comes into his relationship with the Corinthian church. And so he sends Titus uh, to the church to check on how they are doing and how they're responding to uh, the things that he had uh, Kind of addressed in the church. Uh, and then Titus returns back to Paul uh, to tell him that the church is continuing to walk in obedience to what Paul had taught them. And this brings Paul great joy. Uh, and then Titus is sent back with the second letter to the Corinthians and to uh, finish this uh, collection that the church in Corinth was making for the Jerusalem church. So Titus was definitely someone that Paul trusted uh, and Paul had entrusted him with some important tasks uh, in the ministry uh, with uh, also being um, very much part of the work that Paul was doing. Um, we see in Titus 1.5 that Paul leaves uh, Titus in Crete, uh, which is an island. Uh, and uh, this is where, uh, uh, where Titus is believed to have been till he died. Uh, so he stayed there and oversaw the church. Uh, we see in 2 Timothy 4.10 that Titus did go to another province called Dalmatia, but that seems to have been something temporary. Uh, and then he goes back to the island of Crete, uh, where he uh, continues to minister to the church there. So a little bit about Crete. Uh, we, um, we know a little bit of background uh, uh, about this place that uh, people from Crete were viewed by outsiders as people who were lusting after wealth. Uh, and this led to uh, violence even uh, in the island. Uh, Crete had a reputation for arrogance, uh, deceptiveness, betrayal, and greed. And we see in Titus 1.12, uh, where Paul quotes from one of their poets, and he uses the word gluttony to describe them. Uh, now, gluttony here is used uh, to talk about their uh, love for pleasure rather than their love for knowledge. So uh, to distinguish between where what were they pursuing? They were pursuing uh, things of the flesh, material things, uh, rather than uh, things that uh, would um, would edify them intellectually. Uh, and so this was something that was uh, very much a part of the culture of the people who lived on the island of Crete. Uh, so uh, uh, a little bit on the background of Titus. Uh, Crete is first mentioned in Acts 2.11, and this is during the Pentecost. Um, there are uh, Jews and Gentile converts to Judaism who are in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit comes on the believers in the upper room. And uh, it's mentioned that there were Cretans there who heard the disciples declaring the wonders of God in their own town. Uh, so we don't know if uh, there were people here who heard the gospel, who came to faith, and then took that back to the island. Um, that is one possibility. Uh, we also know that Paul visited Crete on his um, on his journey to Rome uh, to be imprisoned. Uh, so when he was uh, being imprisoned, being sent into house arrest the uh, that first time, uh, the ship uh, harbors at the island of Crete. But we have no record of Paul actually getting off and meeting people and sharing the gospel. So um, 
we we don't know if at this time um, there was any um, any work for establishing ch a church in Crete that happened. Um, but uh, another uh, possibility is that on his fourth missionary journey, uh, Paul travels to Crete, shares the gospel, begins a church there, and Titus is left behind to oversee the church. So um, we don't know at what point a church started in this island, but these are the three uh, instances uh, that it could have begun. Um, so we see the issue here in Titus uh, that Paul is addressing is the issue of uh, Jews who are coming in and trying to speak to the uh, Cretan believers uh, and make them follow some of the Jewish laws. So although the culture in Crete was completely different, uh, these people were trying to bring in some of those laws. And this is what Paul wants to address through the letter. Um, so uh, we see Paul addressing some of the opposition in right in the first chapter of Titus. Uh, I'll just read verses 10 to 11 of chapter 1 for us. Um, it says, for there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. So um, here he mentions a specific group, which is the circumcision group. We know uh, the circumcision group is uh, obviously the Jews who were insisting on circumcision of new believers uh, from a Gentile background. Uh, and he says that uh, they are uh, teaching, not only bringing in wrong teaching, uh, but also their intentions are wrong because uh, they are trying to gain uh, monetary uh, benefits through bringing in this teaching. So there's, uh, uh, they're seeking after dishonest gain. And so uh, this is why Paul uh, wants to highlight the um, these false teachers in the letter. Um, so we uh, we see a lot of also uh, what Paul talks about in First Timothy uh, being repeated here. So it seems like that same teaching that was spreading in uh, the congregation uh, that Timothy was overseeing was also spreading to other congregations. And so uh, it was something that was catching on across different churches and needed to be addressed. Um, so in Galatians, uh, we see uh, the same group of people being talked about. And it seems like they were continuing to oppose Paul's work. Um, not only is Paul writing to address false teaching that was coming into the church, his other purpose for writing is to um, to give Titus a sense of authorization uh, to be a leader in the church, to be able to correct people, to be able to teach sound doctrine. Uh, so we'll just read from uh, chapter 1, verse 5. It says, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Uh, so this is one aspect of why he's writing uh, this letter is to give Titus that sense of authority that he is um, he is um, going to lead these churches and lead the elders that are appointed over the churches in Crete. Um, and then we uh, continue to see in chapter 2, I'm just going to read verses uh, 1, 7, 8, and 15. They are noted here on the slide. Uh, so verse 1, you, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. These then are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. So we see uh, Paul uh, 
telling Titus, uh, this is your uh, this is your task. It is to teach sound doctrine, uh, to live a life that uh, also displays this gospel that we are preaching, uh, and then uh, to uh, be able to encourage the believers to also correct the believers with this authority that is yours. I'm giving you this authority uh, or I am entrusting you with this authority over uh, the churches in Crete. Uh, so that is Paul's purpose of writing the letter. Uh, some of the unique features of Titus, uh, of this epistle, uh, Titus uh, addresses this issue of grace as well as good works. So it emphasizes that we are saved uh, by the grace of uh, God, uh, that it is through the work of Christ that we are saved. Um, but at the same time, just as James, um, the, uh, the episode written by the, uh, the book written by James uh, emphasizes good works, uh, Titus will also, Paul in his letter to Titus, will also emphasize good works as a way for um, believers to reveal who Christ is to be witnesses for uh, the faith that we have uh, we have accepted as our own that we have converted to, um, and we also see another unique feature is that Paul quotes from a Cretan poet. Uh, we see this also in Acts seventeen twenty eight, where Paul uses somebody from the culture to which he's ministering. Uh, he uses one of their own writings to address things uh, within the culture. And so uh, we see him doing that here as well in Titus 1.12. Comparing uh, this letter with other books, uh, in 2 Corinthians, uh, that letter was taken by Titus to the church in Corinth. Uh, here, Titus is a recipient of the letter. Like, rather than a carrier of the letter, he's a recipient of the letter. Um, in First Timothy and Titus, we see an emphasis on church organization. Um, first, Second Timothy and Titus are all pastoral letters. Uh, first and Second Timothy uh, tend to fall into a more personal uh, category of writing, whereas Titus is a little more official. And then, um, like James, uh, Titus also emphasizes good works as proof of the faith uh, that uh, we uh, we proclaim, uh, faith in Jesus Christ. Um, the theme of Titus is a God, the godly life of a believer. Um, and so we'll see keywords like good and good works mentioned a lot um, because that is... Uh, displayed in the life of a believer who is truly pursuing godliness. And then the key verse is uh, in chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. I'll read that out for us. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Um, so uh, just as we read this verse, um, we can see so many things that Paul is addressing within the culture itself, right? Like we uh, read about the people there uh, being people who were known for their deceptiveness, who were known uh, for being greedy, for being uh, people who pursued pleasure. Uh, and so he's saying instead of those things, um, Christ came to redeem us from wickedness, to purify us, to set us apart as a people who are godly. And so he's calling them to live these, uh, to live such godly lives uh, so that um, they can be a witness and uh, to live the uh, live such lives in um, in anticipation of Christ's return. 
uh, we'll just go through uh, quickly the outline of uh, this book. So it begins, like every other letter, with a salutation, a greeting Titus. Um, and then uh, he addresses um, certain things uh, to do with elders. Uh, so the first thing uh, we read about was why he left Titus in this island. Um, and it was to, uh, to choose elders for the different churches that had been established. And then from there, he goes on to say, so what are the kinds of qualities we're looking for when we choose elders? Uh, and that is in chapter 1, verse 6 to 9. Uh, he talks about the family life of the uh, of uh, a believer, uh, the character that is displayed by them, and then their ability to teach sound doctrine. So these were three things that he says are important in choosing uh, the right people to serve as elders over the church. And why is sound doctrine important is where he continues in chapter one to talk about the false teachers who had come in uh, and specifically mentions the circumcision group and Jewish myths as two uh, threats to uh, the teaching that he had taken uh, to the church. Uh, then he goes on in chapter two. Uh, to address various groups in the congregation. And the main goal of uh, addressing these groups is to say that they are to be witnesses through their lives. Uh, so the church should stand out from the culture around them and through their godly lives uh, to be able to witness to the gospel. Uh, I'll just read verse 15 from chapter 2. It says, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. So this is part of that key verse that uh, we read earlier. Uh, in chapter 3, he goes on to talk about believers in general. Uh, and he talks about being transformed by grace received through Christ, being reborn to eternal life through the Holy Spirit. Uh, and he addresses uh, certain uh, errors in, uh, in spiritual teaching that had come in uh, from verses 9 to 11 of chapter 3. So he says, but avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Again, going back to that wrong teaching that had come in, and he says, don't waste your time on these things. These things are not uh, worth your time and they're not going to be fruitful for you. Uh, he closes the letter with an invitation to Titus to visit him uh, as he's going to Nicopolis and then uh, with certain greetings from other people who were with him. So with that, we come to the end of uh, Titus. And uh, we can just take a quick look at Philemon. Philemon is a very short book. It's just one chapter. So uh, we will take a quick look at it. And uh, with that, we will end uh, this video. Um, so Philemon was a letter that was written to a specific person. And it's a letter addressing a private issue uh, that is relevant to that person. It's quite different from Paul's other letters because all of his other letters have to do with the church and with ministry. Um, but this is a, an, an issue that is particular to Philemon. And Paul is writing a letter to him to address that issue. Uh, it's probably written from Rome while Paul was in prison. Uh, and it was sent to Philemon, who lived at Colossia. Uh, now, how do we know that Philemon lived at Colossia? Uh, if we look at the book of Colossians, there are certain people who are named there who are also named in the book, uh, in the letter to Philemon. And in um, in Colossians, those people are named as people who are from Colossia. Uh, so we'll just read these three verses that I've put down here. Uh, verse 9 from chapter 4 of uh, Colossians. It says, he is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. 
um, they will tell you everything that is happening here. So Onesimus is from Colossia, and we know that Onesimus is the main subject of the letter to Philemon. Um, he is uh, a slave that belonged to Philemon, and Paul is writing on his behalf uh, to uh, Philemon to address uh, some issues that had come up. Uh, verse 12 of chapter 4 in Colossians, uh, Paul says, Epiphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. Uh, and so this same Epiphras is also named in Philemon 123. And then uh, in verse 17 of Colossians 4, uh, Paul says, tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord, uh, meaning that Archippus was in Colossia, and so he's giving them a specific message to pass on to Archippus. Um, and Archippus is also mentioned in Philemon 1, 2. So uh, considering all of these people who are named in uh, this letter to Philemon and in Colossians as people who belong to the church at Colossia, uh, we conclude that Philemon was from Colossia. Um, so from uh, verse 2 of uh, the letter to Philemon, we see that there was a church that was meeting in his home. Uh, we also can gather from some of the things that are said in the letter that Philemon was someone who had considerable wealth. Uh, we see uh, that he was someone who was generous towards the church, um, maybe not necessarily uh, limited to monetary generosity um, because uh, we see love for God's holy people mentioned, partnership with Paul in the faith, and then uh, being someone who has refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. So Philemon was definitely contributing uh, to the work of ministry um, in more ways than just by monetary support. But it seems that this is one of the ways in which he was supporting the work. Um, we also see that Paul uh, makes a request to Philemon to keep a place ready for him to stay with Philemon when he goes to uh, to Colossia. And so uh, that is another indication that he was someone who could um, who could host Paul during his time there. Um, we also, just from the content of the letter, know that uh, the main issue that Paul is addressing here is um, the issue of a slave named Onesimus who belonged to Philemon. And for Philemon to own a slave, uh, it would have required him to uh, to pay a certain um, sum of money. So he was able to also own a slave to uh, to make that payment, which was not a small amount. Uh, so we also know that Paul never went to Colossia. Uh, so it's possible that he met Philemon in Ephesus and Philemon came to faith during Paul's ministry there. Uh, because in verse 19 of, uh, of Philemon, Paul says, you owe me your very self, indicating that uh, Philemon uh, kind of owed his whole, uh, his whole uh, eternal, uh, that eternal life that he had received owed it to Paul's ministry. Uh, so uh, it's likely that this happened in Ephesus since Paul had never been to Colossia. So what is it that Paul is addressing in the letter to Philemon? Uh, we look a little bit at uh, Onesimus and who he was and what it is that uh, prompted Paul to write this letter to Philemon. So Onesimus was a slave of Philemon who had run away. Uh, it's possible that he had taken some of Philemon's money. Uh, this could have happened in two ways. One is that um, Philemon had sent him on an errand and had, um, had entrusted him with some money to carry out that errand. And so while Onesimus was 
doing that work that Philemon had sent him out for, he, instead of going back to Philemon, ran away and fled to Rome. So he had Philemon's money with him and escaped uh, to Rome. Uh, another uh, reason we can say that he had taken Philemon's money was because Philemon had paid to um, to own Onesimus as his slave. He had made a payment to have Onesimus under his authority. And so Onesimus was um, of value to him, of monetary value to him. And the fact that Onesimus had run away um, was like he had actually stolen from Philemon. Uh, but when Onesimus goes to Rome, is where he meets Paul and comes to faith and becomes a disciple of Christ. Um, he, uh, uh, Paul could have chosen to keep Onesimus as a helper with him, but because he didn't have Philemon's consent, he's sending Onesimus back to Philemon and allowing Philemon that freedom to decide whether he's going to send him back to continue to assist Paul. Um, now, as per Roman law, this was required of Paul. He uh, could not uh, hide a runaway slave. That would be against the law of the, uh, of the Roman government. And so Paul was uh, following what was required of him under the law. Some background on slavery, just so we understand um, why why uh, Paul had to write this letter. Uh, slaves, while they were recognized as people, uh, were also, from an economic perspective, they were considered as uh, property of their owners. So they were not only just um, people who, uh, who had whatever uh, relationships had a status in society, all of that. They were also uh, people who belonged to, who were completely under the authority of their owners. Uh, there were two kinds of slaves. There was the household slaves and the urban slaves. Um, Paul, in his writings, addresses only household slaves. And so uh, this issue of urban slavery is not addressed really by Paul. Uh, household slaves could uh, could eventually be freed from their masters. They could um, work to earn enough to uh, pay for their freedom. And once they were free, under Roman custom, it was uh, it was almost required of the one who had freed them, their previous owners, to support uh, the these former slaves and help them become wealthy. So uh, it is um, it is possible that a slave could work for their freedom. Um, also, uh, slaves were economically, socially, and also in terms of being able to uh, determine what their future would look like. They had more privileges than the average free person in the Roman Empire. So uh, most of the people who were free were rural peasants. Uh, they would serve as farmers on uh, the estates of wealthy landowners. So they had very little um, economic or social status. And in terms of thinking about a different future for themselves, uh, that was uh, very, very limited for them because uh, they were in a place of complete dependence on these landowners. Uh, whereas slaves actually had a lot more uh, potential to grow economically, socially, think about a different future for themselves. Um, we don't see slavery as something that was recognized as uh, an issue in that society. Uh, so in a time like that, Paul's message is quite um, quite uh, quite different. He goes uh, quite beyond the culture of that time to address uh, this issue of a slave who has run away and to request uh, the owner to show grace towards that person. Uh, but not only to show them grace, uh, also to possibly release them 
from slavery so that he could join Paul in the ministry because he now is a believer. So uh, Paul, what he's doing to even represent uh, Onesimus, who is in a position of complete dependence, complete submission to a master, but also has run away and actually uh, would be subject to uh, grave consequences for what he had done. Uh, Paul is writing um, in a way that is quite counter to the culture, countercultural in that sense, uh, to talk about grace and to talk about even setting such a slave free. Um, so that is um, that's something to see uh, Paul bringing in the faith and how uh, you can address an issue that may be culturally acceptable, but to talk about how does our faith um, faith change the way we respond to a certain situation. Uh, some features of this letter. Uh, Philemon is the only completely private letter in scripture. So um, all of the other letters are written to uh, ministers, to churches. Um, they are letters that circulated in the churches. Uh, so they were written um, from a ministry perspective. But this is to a person regarding a personal issue. Um, it also gives us a glimpse into the social life and relationships uh, at this time. Uh, so Paul is not uh, socially at the same level as Philemon. He doesn't share the same social status. But his request comes from someone who has authority as an apostle, as, uh, as someone who had brought Philemon to faith, uh, and as a brother in Christ. And he uses this relationship to plead on behalf of Onesimus. Uh, the date and place of writing is uh, while, while Paul was under house arrest in Rome, thought to be around 60 to 62 AD. Uh, compared to other books, uh, we see in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, uh, this abolishing of uh, differences within the church uh, between Jews and Gentiles slave, uh, those who are slaves and those who are free, all of those boundaries do not exist anymore in the body of Christ. And so uh, this letter is um, almost like a practical example of how those boundaries are to be broken down. Uh, when Paul asks Philemon uh, to receive Onesimus back uh, as a brother in Christ, as a beloved brother in Christ. Um, so Philemon, along with Ephesians, Philippines, Colossians, and 2 Timothy, uh, are, is one of the epistles that was written while Paul was in prison. Um, so it's one of the prison epistles. Um, Philemon talks about how love is to be illustrated or love is to be shown within the body of Christ, while Ephesians and Colossians uh, show that Christians form the body of Christ. Um, and then in comparison to Colossians, except for Philemon and Aphia, everyone mentioned in this letter to Philemon is also mentioned in Colossians. We read some of those names earlier. Uh, so we see that uh, the same people who are in this letter are also in Colossians, except for Philemon and Aphia. Uh, the theme of Philemon is Paul's intercession or pleading for a runaway slave. Uh, the key verse from 15b to 18, um, I'll just read that for us. You might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. So here Paul is willing to take personal uh, ownership of Onesimus's um, 
Onesimus's um, mistakes and the consequences of those mistakes, Paul is willing to take that on himself. Uh, we will not look at an outline of this letter since uh, it's just a single chapter and we've covered so much of the content as we've discussed the book itself. Um, but we'll just close with some spiritual lessons that we can learn from Paul's example in this letter. Uh, one is to sympathize with those who are in um, positions of disadvantage, so with the lowly. Um, here, Paul didn't have to take on this as his responsibility, but he stands on behalf of Onesimus uh, using um, on the power, the authority, the friendship, the relationship that exists with Philemon uh, to be able to, uh, to help Onesimus out in a difficult situation. Uh, he, we also see uh, that the law, obedience to the law is something that is not uh, discarded as unimportant, rather uh, it is upheld, the law is upheld, where Onesimus must return to Philemon and Paul must send him back as someone who is aware of Onesimus's, um, uh, where Onesimus is. He doesn't try to hide him, rather he's encouraging Onesimus to go back to Philemon. And then the third is that uh, in this relationship of brotherhood and sisterhood in Christ, uh, all social and class distinctions that may have existed in the cultures we come from uh, are broken down, are removed within the body of Christ. That is uh, the ideal we pursue, uh, that we should uh, come to a place of equality, of uh, respect, mutual respect and honor towards uh, one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, so we close here. Uh, thank you for watching and thank you for um, for allowing me to do this video to catch up on what we missed. Um, I trust that you've been blessed through these two books and um, I didn't um, I didn't pray right at the beginning of class so I'll close us in prayer and then we can um, end uh, today's class. Father, we just thank you. Um, thank you for these letters that were written by Paul. Thank you, Lord, that they were inspired by your Holy Spirit. Thank you, uh, Father, uh, for speaking to us through these letters, for teaching us who you are, teaching us the things that you value, Lord, that you value uh, godly lives, you value uh, lives that are, are completely surrendered to you, Lord, that you value all people, slave or free, uh, no matter what the background is, Lord, you invite us to follow you and uh, you place us on uh, equal grounding with each other, Lord. Uh, Father, we just pray that what we have discussed today what we have looked at in your word uh, would take root in our hearts, Lord, that it would be something that addresses um, our own ways of thinking, our own ways of seeing the world, Lord, that it would bring the transformation that you would desire to see in us. We thank you for this time, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Um, and uh, we'll continue from here. Uh, to go on to the rest of the uh, books and letters that we have um, and um, continue in our New Testament survey. Thank you.